Praise the Lord. We thank God for this wonderful time of teaching service. It's time to feed on the word. It's time to enjoy our King of glory. The Lord will feed us indeed. The Bible says that great joy of those who, those who find God's word like a spoil. They find God's word like a spoil. They rejoice over the word. They sell everything to make sure they possess and purchase the word. The Bible says we should buy truth and sell it not because there's something about God's word that changes and transforms our lives. Shall we pray? Oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, as we come to you in this teaching service, we pray that God, your spirit will teach us. Your spirit will lead us into all truth. Your spirit will show us the way we should go. Help us, O oh God, not just to acquire data and information, but let our information be translated into a rhema, that which will transform us. Help us, O oh God, by the Spirit, even with the grace to apply the things we study. And may we, O oh God, even be sons and daughters that will bring you glory. We thank you. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Praise the Lord. Today we are talking about the greatest harvest. We are talking about the greatest harvest. The greatest harvest. The greatest harvest. There are good harvests. There are great harvests. But today we are talking about the greatest harvest. The greatest harvest. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to verse 11. Luke 5, from verses 1 to 11. Now it occurred that while the people pressed upon Jesus to hear the message of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats drawn up by the lake, but the fishermen had gone down from them and were washing their nets. And getting into one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon Peter, he requested him to draw away a little from the shore. Then he sat down and continued to teach the crowd of people from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon Peter, put out into the deep water and lower your nets for a haul. And Simon Peter answered, Master, we toiled all night exhaustingly and caught nothing in our nets. But on the ground of your word, I will lower the nets again. And when they had done that, they caught a great number of fish. It's a great fish. It's a great catch. And as their nets were at the point of breaking, they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and take hold with them. And they came and filled both the boats, so they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was gripped with bewildering amazement, allied to terror. And all who were with him at the hall of fish which they had made. And so also were James and John, son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon Peter. And Jesus said to Simon, Have no fear, from now on you will be catching men. And after they had run their boat on shore, they left everything, including the fish, and joined him as his disciples and sided with his party and accompanied him. May God bless this word. Today we are talking about the greatest harvest. We define harvest to be the act and the process 
of gathering in crops. Or we said it is winning an achievement. In the Hebrew, when we talk about harvest, we are talking about the entire cycle of sowing to the point of harvesting. So the crop, the reapers, and the time, the season, the sowing, and the gathering, all of that refers to a harvest. So it, it makes it very clear that from the day you sow, your harvest has begun. From the day you plant, your harvest has begun. That is why most farmers are men of faith. Most farmers are women of faith. Because they know that once the seed goes to the ground, their harvest have also started. They only wait for the maturation of the real and the actual harvest. Harvest is the reward for an exerted effort or exerting strength. What it means is that in harvest, God is the one who does the hard work and we join him in partnership. Harvest is the expectation of all mankind. I'm yet to meet any human being who does not expect a harvest in life. Anybody go to school, go to school expecting to harvest something. Anybody who do an investment, invest with an expectation of receiving something. Anybody who does anything does it in a, with an expectation. Anybody who pursues a young man or pursues a young woman expect that one day they become not only love bears but they become covenant bears. Harvest is a public or an open reward for a private labor. The Lord said, Jesus said, for God sees in the dark, but he rewards in the open. So harvest is the open or public reward for that which we have done in private. When you are sowing, most people will not see you because you are even bent and stooped. But when you are harvesting, that's where you see a lot of people rejoicing with you and getting excited about your harvest. Harvest is an expectation of the living. It means that once you are alive, there's an expectation in your heart. The ones who do not have an expectation are those who are dead. Even there are those who die in the Lord, who have an expectation of the resurrection of the righteous. Harvest is an expectation of the living. Harvest is the reason we defy all hearts. Harvest is the reason why we defy all odds to take daily risk. Harvest is the reason we defy all the odds in order to gain things. We take daily risk, we defy all the odds, and we defy everything. We take the risk because we expect a harvest. I expect a harvest. So as a preacher, sometimes my voice will not allow me. Sometimes my body will not allow me. But I defy all the hearts because I know the word of God is a seed. And as I keep sowing it as a preacher, as I keep sowing it as a man of God, I expect that the Lord will surely bring a harvest. Say hallelujah. All others are not the same. All of us are not the same in quantum, in quality, in time, and in value. All harvests are not the same. We've got to understand that. Once your field is small, and you sow just small, and I sow a lot, and I sow a bigger field, you don't expect to have the same harvest like mine. So all harvests are not the same. There are unique harvests. Because I've been unique sowings and laboring. Now I want us to glean the passage. And this is the part one of the greatest harvest. When we say something is greatest, it means you are making comparison with two or more things. Once something is greatest, the adjective qualifies the quantum, qualifies the quality, 
qualifies the value of that thing. So we talk about greatest harvest, we are talking about a, a harvest in gargantuan measures, a harvest in behemoth measures, a harvest in a mount, mountainous measures, a harvest that is huge. And the Lord is calling you and I into the greatest harvest, which is a huge harvest. So Jesus was by the sea of Galilee. And Jesus Christ saw a harvest. So Jesus Christ decided he would deploy all the principles that is required for the harvest to come. Number one, verse 1a. Number one, verse 1a. We are looking at Luke chapter 5. Number one, verse 1a. For every great harvest, you need a strategic location. For every great harvest, you will need a great location. Your location in relation to your harvest is very important. Your location in relation to your harvest is very important. If I want to harvest fishes, I don't go to the forest. If I want to harvest mangoes, I don't go to the beach. So we need to understand a mango harvest requires you go to the forest or go to the field. A fish harvest requires you go to the sea and go to the beach. People harvest means that you go to where people are gathered. So for every great harvest, you need a strategic location. So Jesus Christ, the Bible said, came to a place called the Sea of Galilee, which is Gennesaret. And in Gennesaret, the people refer to the place, or Bible refer to the place, or research refer to the place as the paradise of Galilee. This is the paradise of Galilee. So it's a place like Miami Beach, or a place like uh, Dubai, or a place like Sunset Beach in California, somewhere in Hollywood, or a place where we know where we, we can find people gather. That is where Jesus found himself. So this Sea of Galilee is not only a paradise, it was also referred to as a place for beauty and fertility. It means that people come and they do therapy. They do beauty therapy and they go through fertility therapy. So this location attracts all manner of people with different needs. Those who want to conceive will come. Those who want to anti-age will come. Those who have problems with their skin and their faces will come. Those who are grooming themselves for marriage will come. And different people come to this paradise of a beach. And Jesus Christ found himself also there. So the harvest was great. Jesus had different people that he saw as a target. The people have come to receive the fruit of the womb. The people have come in order to have healing for their beauty. The people who have come in order to enjoy, enjoy the paradise of this beach. So they are actually tourists. There are people who are indigenous. There are people who are mariners. There are people who are doing fishing business. All manner of people were there. So Jesus saw the place as a strategic location. So for every great harvest, you need a strategic location. What do you seek to harvest in life? You've got to find the location of that harvest. What do you seek to procure? You've got to go to the place of that procurement. If I seek even to catch special birds, or maybe follow special, colorful, specific species of butterfly, I need to find out my research where those butterflies gravitate or where they can be located. So for every single harvest, there is a strategic location. Jesus was by the sea of Galilee. He wanted to catch a great harvest. And Jesus saw that that is a place for the action to take place. We are talking about the great harvest or the greatest harvest. And this greatest harvest is in reference to the souls of men. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming. And the time for Jesus to come is almost near. 
And all of us need even to get ourselves ready and to be part of the global evangelization. The global evangelization. We need to be part with those and partner with those who are burdened to win souls. So we need to find where the souls are and go to where the souls can be found. We need to be strategic in our planning, in our programming, in our fundraising effort and fund a location as a body of Christ and as a church. We need to ask God to send us to a, a strategic location. Number two, verses 1b. Number two, verses 1b. According to the scriptures, for every great harvest, we must discern the burden of the masses. For every great harvest, we must discern the burden of the masses. The Bible said Jesus was at the beach. He did not invite the people to come. The people were pressing on him to hear the word. The people were pressing on Jesus to hear the word. The people were pressing on Jesus to hear the word. The Bible says in the book of Amos that a time is coming that men, because of the famine of the word of God, will begin to press from all the nations of the earth and they will be looking for the word of the Lord in the mouth of men of God, prophets of God, teachers, evangelists and apostles who carry the word of God, the true word of God. So they came to Jesus. But Jesus was able to discern. That's why he went to that location. There are people who need the word of God. There are people who need deliverance. There are people who need even to hear. There are people who need to be touched. There are people like Zacchaeus. The world is against them. The systems will not allow them to come to Jesus. So they have climbed trees. Some of them are hiding in places. Some of them are going to do things because they cannot come out. We need to discern the needs of the people so that we will be able to find ourselves in their various locations. People are bleeding. The heart of people are yelling. People are crying for a savior every day. People are crying for a savior every moment. People are crying for a savior every time. We need to discern by the spirit. So that the Spirit can lead us to the places where we can reach out to people. The Bible said, A eunuch came to Jerusalem on his way back in the book of Acts chapter 8. He was reading the book of Isaiah chapter 53. And this man was burdened. Even though he was a Gentile. Even though he was answered the commonwealth of God. This man was a seeker. He was seeking the truth. He desired, he yearned to know the truth. And the Bible said the Spirit of God came upon Philip. And Philip was carried by the Spirit even towards the chariot of the Ethiopian eunuch. And then he saw the man reading the book of Isaiah. And when the man saw him, the man said, This thing that I read, is it about the prophet or is it about someone else? Philip took the, the, the readings of the man and was able to teach him. And bring him into salvation. Bringing other scriptures to him. The same thing happens today in our generation. There are many Ethiopian eunuchs. They are rich. They are wealthy. They are connected. They are highly connected. There are people in politics that are yearning for the gospel. There are people in high places that are yearning. There are people in the judiciary. There are people in the legislature. There are people in the various eight societal gates. And they are yearning. They are yearning. They are yearning. They are yearning for the gospel. They desire the gospel. They want to see the hear the gospel. They want to be touched by the power of the gospel. They are really and truly yearning. We need to discern even the burdens. And we need to discern the needs of these people. And let God use us. Hallelujah. People are ready. Jesus said, the harvest is white. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send the rightful redemptive laborers. May we become the redemptive laborers who will be sent by the Lord of the harvest into the field to save the souls of men. For every great harvest, there must be, we must discern the burden of the masses. Number three, verses 1c. Number three. For every great harvest, there must be 
equality seed. I just quoted Amos chapter 8, where God said a lot of people travel from sea to sea, from shore to shore, from nation to nations, and they'll be looking for the word of the Lord in the mouth of the true servants of God. He said there shall be a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, not a famine of water, but a famine of the word of the Lord. And we are in that generation where a lot of the pulpits all over the world are not bringing the word of the Lord. Even to the people, even the quality seed, the quality word that can generate a good harvest in their souls and their spirits. For every great harvest, there must be a quality seed. Why did the people press to Jesus? The Bible said they pressed to Jesus to hear the word of God. They pressed to Jesus to hear the locus of God. They pressed to Jesus to know the total embodiment of God's revealed will and counsel. That is the logos. Today, people want to see Jesus in the messages they hear. And there are people who have the message Jesus in their messages. Jesus is no more the central key. Jesus is no more the central focus. Jesus is no more the goal of preaching anymore. So we preach other things and we excite the people. We make them laugh. We tickle them. And Jesus is out of the picture. When we lift Jesus in our messages, we lift Jesus in our worship, we lift Jesus in our preaching, we lift Jesus in our pulpit, he will draw all men to himself. Just as Moses lifted up the brazen serpent in the wilderness, so shall God through us Lift Jesus for people to be saved. Look and leave. People want to look and leave because they have been beaten by the serpents and the snakes of the world. Number four. Verses two to three. Number four. Verses two to three. For every great harvest, for every great harvest, you will need a strategic platform. In verses 2 and 3, Jesus saw the need. He had a quality seed. He saw the people pressing for the word. But Jesus needed a pulpit. He needed an altar. He needed an elevated place. So Jesus saw two boats. And in the boats, the boats were empty. The fishermen had gone out. And the Bible said they were washing their net. They are just washing their net. And Jesus was observing. In other words, Jesus Christ saw a strategic platform and he took note of those who own that platform. For every great harvest, there is a strategic platform that everybody needed. In this case, what strategic platform was Jesus looking for? Jesus was looking for a boat. He needed a boat. He needed somebody's resource. He needed somebody's blessing. He needed somebody's capacity. He needed somebody's boat in order to use to preach. For every great harvest, there is the need for a strategic platform. Your life might be the strategic platform. Your heart might be the strategic platform. Your money, your building, your land, even your stage, even your equipment, your instrument might be that strategic platform that Jesus Christ will need today in order to reach out to the greatest harvest. Hallelujah. So there were two ships standing by. They were empty, not busy or not in use. The boats were empty. The boats were not in use. The boats were not busy. We need to understand that there is nothing that is useless. The fact that the boats were empty doesn't mean the boats were not of good use. The boats were useful. The boats were in good use. The boats were going to be a blessing. Sometimes we look at people, we look at their lives, and we think there is nothing they can offer. We look at people around us, and we think they are so empty that there is nothing. One time I, I read a book on uh, George Mueller and some of the great men that were great apostles of revival. 
And one of them had to use a drunkard to be his interpreter. Because nobody could interpret the English or from English to the other language. But a drunkard. That drunkard was a strategic platform for this man of God. Maybe if you and I were the ones to be, to, to be used by God at that time, we will condemn the drunkard. We will say he's empty. He has nothing to offer. He's empty. He's of no use. But Jesus found two empty boats. They were not in use, but they were of use. They were empty, but they provided a platform for Jesus to reach out to the greatest harvest. May the Lord God help us to always look at people and look at things the way God himself will look at. For when David saw the Egyptian that was left to die by his master, the Amalekite, David did not see an empty Egyptian. David saw a door to his miracle. David saw a door to his miracle. Jesus saw the empty boats, and the empty boats were a door to the greatest harvest. There is something God may have brought your way. It could be a person, it could be a pain, it could be a situation, it could be a challenge, it could be, it could be something that you do not see any value with it. But if God brought it, see it as a strategic platform for the greatest harvest. Jesus identified the fishermen and the owners of this particular platform so that Jesus will not be rude trying to use people's things without permission or without any respect. Today, as I draw the curtains on part one of this message on the greatest harvest, I want you to know that for every great harvest, you need a strategic location. Jesus found himself in this beach called the Paradise of Galilee. A place where people came for beauty therapy, for healing, for fertility, and for the conception, and for the fruit of the womb. And Jesus also was there because he knew that people had need. For every great harvest, we must learn to descend the needs of people. People have needs and they are crying. People have burdens and they want somebody to reach out to them. For every great harvest, we are said today, there must be a quality seed. And then for every great harvest, you will need, or there's the need for a strategic platform. And as we pray, as we have heard the word, I want you to pray that God will be able to help you to see the location where your greatest harvest is found. And I'm talking about this great harvest, or greatest harvest, of the source of men. No money in your pocket. Not material harvest. We are talking about harvest that is so eternal. It has to do with the souls of men. God has positioned a soul for you somewhere. God is using someone to cry to you. For you to come. Just like a dream. Poor heart. He had a dream that a man from Macedonia was crying to them. Come and help us from Macedonia. Today. May God help you and I to hear the cry of the men from Macedonia. May God help you and I to hear the cry of the women from our village. May God help us to hear the cry of the poor, the needy, those who sit by the streets, the widow, the orphans, and all the people that most people will ignore, that we will carry the quality seed of God even to them. God bless you. This is Pastor Shamus in Glory Abbey, your friend, your pastor, your servant and your beloved one, as we engage all the time on this platform of the mega breath, God gives us fresh word. God brings us to the place where we receive to become different. God bless you. I'll see you again with a part two on the greatest harvest. Get ready to receive more. You'll never be the same again. Amen.